tonight. A new COVID-19 subvariant is expected to spread quickly in our province. We hear from Saskatchewan's chief medical health officer. Also, debate over gas stoves has reignited after a bombshell study linking emissions from gas stoves to childhood asthma. Plus, from sun dogs to snow rollers, we look at five cool weather phenomena connected to winter. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Friday, January 13th, a beautiful view from Fish Lake, thanks to Sherry Lynn Jensen. The CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Saskatchewan is quickly approaching the third anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic in this province. Many things may seem like they're back to normal or new normal at least, but there are still COVID developments to be aware of. Alexander Kwan has the details. 2023 is a new year. It will also likely mark the beginning of a new dominant Omicron subvariant in Saskatchewan. The first cases of XBB 1.5 were reported by the province last month, and the number of cases is expected to rise quickly. With a few cases here in Saskatchewan, we are very likely to see those increase exponentially. I think it will probably follow a path similar to the other variants, but perhaps with greater speed because of the infectiousness of this subvariant itself. It's believed this latest subvariant will not cause more severe infections. However, it is likely more transmissible than previous subvariants, meaning it will spread faster. That's why health authorities in the US and the UK have said XBB 1.5 will quickly become the dominant strain of COVID-19 in their respective countries. Here at home, the province's chief medical health officer agrees. Over the last three years, every new variant is more transmissible and that, that's why that becomes the dominant variant. Despite this, don't expect the province's approach to change. What we need to do in response to that is not any different from what we've been doing so far. Get the bivalent vaccine, you know, choose to wear a mask in an indoor crowded space if you're visiting someone at high risk or if you yourself are at high risk, you know, you know, wear a mask more consistently, your best mask. But other experts say we should be looking at implementing measures rather than taking a wait and see approach. They say it is never too late to act. I'm not a proponent of letter rip. I don't think we should just sort of sit back and let it and let the wave carry us away. I think the public health costs of that are too great. Cold and flu season is already in full swing along with plenty of cases of RSV. And now it's clear that COVID-19 will also be here in the weeks to come. Alexander Kwan, CBC News, Regina. More Canadian workers than ever before have guaranteed paid sick leave. Ottawa's new law means hundreds of thousands of workers in federally regulated workplace have 10 days per year. But the legislation doesn't cover all workers. As Anise Harday explains, some employers say offering the paid benefit is good for business. The biggest concern at this Calgary faucet factory is keeping the machinery working, not the staff. They can call in sick. Jay Staples works on the production line. Nobody comes to work sick around here because we all have that peace of mind that you can take the day off and get better. Staples didn't have this benefit at his previous jobs. It was definitely a huge perk. It wasn't something that I was used to. Ottawa's law on paid sick leave doesn't apply to Alberta factories like this one. Tapmaster does it anyway. We started offering it because people need time off, and if they're sick, they're not super productive at work anyways. Paid sick days don't cost Tapmaster much, but that's not always the case. We are a trades business, goods and service, and when people call in sick, their clients don't come in. The business does lose that revenue. For some businesses, like this hair salon, a sick call is expensive. Dana Lysing already pays for sick days due to BC law. She says the government shouldn't just legislate sick time, it should pay, because it costs her business tens of thousands of dollars. I believe in these sick days, but I also believe that the government already has this money. They are collecting employment insurance from employees and employers on every payroll. 
Regardless of who pays, most workers in Canada don't have guaranteed sick days. The new federal law applies to less than a million employees in industries like banking, transportation, or communications. This expert says paid sick leave should be legislated everywhere. It improves their own health, it supports their family, and for businesses, it does support better health within your your workplace and your business. It also keeps illness from spreading at work. A small company like ours, we only have 10 employees. If four or five people are gone sick, then we're pretty much stuck. So for this business, the cost of sick leave is a good investment. Anise Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. If you like to cook with gas appliances, you may want to rethink your choice. This after a recent study linked gas stoves with an increased risk of asthma in children. Pratush Jayal has the details. It's a common sight and sound in many Canadian kitchens. But every time a gas burner is sparked, harmful gases are emitted. The levels right now in our lab are 24 parts per billion, which is well below the 90 parts per billion that's uh, suggested by Health Canada. But if we had a gas stove, for example, in the lab, those levels would go up and quite possibly exceed those limits. Cahan says prolonged exposure to gas stoves can lead to asthma and other respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. In the U.S., a commissioner with the consumer watchdog sounded the alarm last month, even suggesting a ban on gas stoves. But the Consumer Product Safety Chair clarified that is unlikely. The concerns come after a recent U.S. study linked the emissions from gas stoves to asthma. A study that... Uh, suggested that almost 13% of all childhood asthma cases can be attributed to gas stove use, which is a lot. Cahan says between 2017 and 2018, she and her colleagues took pollution readings inside a household after cooking with a gas stove. They were surprised by both how high the levels of nitrogen oxides were and how long they lasted. Cahan says nitrogen dioxide produced when the gas is burned is a concerning pollutant. It can be associated with uh, making respiratory illnesses like asthma worse. And even, especially for children, it can actually cause asthma um, if there's prolonged exposure. Cahan says multiple studies show levels of nitrogen dioxide emitted by gas stoves exceed, in some cases even 100 times higher, above what Health Canada guidelines. This prompted her to get rid of her own gas stove and switch to an electric induction cooktop. She says others should do the same. When you actually see the pollution in your home, because we had you know, instruments that were making these measurements every uh, 10 seconds, so we could see the levels you know, just being nice and flat to suddenly really high and staying high. And when you see that, you know, it's almost like seeing the air change color, right? You're like, oh, that's really gross. Sask Energy says there are nearly 20,000 gas stoves in the province right now. It says if you choose to use one, you should make sure you have a range hood that provides ventilation to avoid recirculating unhealthy air. Pratish Tyal, CBC News, Saskatoon. White City has lost its bid to annex land from the neighboring rural municipality. The Saskatchewan Municipal Board has denied White City's application to absorb the subdivision of Emerald Park and other properties in its area. The community east of Regina says it needed more land to thrive financially and to stave off future tax increases. The RM of Edenwald, where the properties are located, says allowing the annexation would be a setback that could take many years to recover from. Its leaders are pleased by the decision, but White City's mayor says he is very disappointed and concerned this decision sets a dangerous precedent. It should come as no surprise. Regina Pats captain Connor Bedard still holds down the top spot for this year's NHL draft. NHL Central Scouting released its mid-season rankings today. Connor Bedard is ranked first amongst all North American skaters as he leads the WHL in points with 70. He's currently on a 29-game point scoring streak. Leading Team Canada to a gold medal at the World Juniors only tightened Bedard's grip as the consensus number one pick in the draft. At this point, Columbus and Chicago have the best chance at the overall first selection. Bedard and the Pats host Saskatoon tonight at the Brand Center. A vehicle cracked through ice this week at Echo Valley Provincial Park in the Quipel Valley. 
It's believed the driver was returning to the boat launch area after ice fishing that afternoon. We spoke to a local resident who noticed this SUV got stuck on the ice about 40 feet from the shore. He says it had driven over an area of thin ice that has a current beneath it. That's where Pasqua Lake and Echo Lake connect. Locals know not to drive over that section. The front end went through and the back end was still up on the ice and then it just went, did the nose dive down? Oh, well, another one bites the dust. <laughs> a lot of folks will drive on, they'll drive 100 yards, they'll get out and they'll drill a hole, see what the ice depth is and ensure that it stays within that, that comfort zone that they need uh, when driving. Another one would be, as, as is the point there in the uh, between the two, um, uh, two Capel Lakes, is water flow that might be coming through especially when we're going to be experiencing warmer weather as we are going to be over the next week or so, there's going to be, there's going to generate more water moving through those areas um, and thin the ice from below to the top. Crab says ice fishers should stick big branches in thin ice that has a spring running underneath it. This will warn others not to drive over that section. Crab says 12 inches of ice is the safest for cars to drive over. SGI says it's received three claims for vehicles that have gone through the ice since November. Well, you might not need these while it's warmer out, but these will come in real handy on colder days. The city of Regina has unveiled new community fire pits at five local parks. The goal is to help people stay and play longer outside with a warm-up station. You can find them at Gosky, Les Sherman, Mount Pleasant, Regent and Ruth M. Buck Parks. They're open for use from noon till 11 p.m. each day. You're just asked to bring your own seasoned firewood. We'll be back after the break. Let's face it, winter on the prairies is not always fun. The air sometimes hurts our faces. But there is beauty to be found in all that cold and snow. At least that's what our weather specialist, Ethan Williams, thinks. Here he is with five winter weather phenomena you can enjoy this season and what causes them. There's plenty of winter wonder to be seen on the ground or in the sky. We'll start with number five, sun dogs. These appear as halos around the sun and usually show up when it's really cold. Rays from the sun pass through certain shaped ice crystals and the ice crystals can either be up in cirrus clouds at very high altitude or they can be very close to the ground. And sun dogs are just one of numerous types of sun and moon halos. Number four is rime ice. We've seen a lot of this recently. And it's the result of dense fog. Fog is made up of tiny water droplets. And when fog forms below freezing, the droplets freeze. And when the droplets freeze on things like tree branches, they make beautiful scenes like this. But rime ice can cling to power lines, and it's been known to cause widespread power outages. Number three is a pretty fascinating one, snow rollers. They're like winter tumbleweeds or snowballs, but formed by nature instead of humans. You need three key ingredients to form them. Generally, you need fresh snow, and you have to have pretty mild temperatures as well, uh, so that the snow is sticky. And if the winds are persistent too, not so much gusty winds, but a persistent wind, and pushing it, it helps that make those rollers and keep them going. And they can get pretty large too, like this one seen earlier this month in Saskatchewan. Number two will make you scratch your head. It's Fata Morgana. This type of mirage makes faraway objects look inverted or even upside down. It's caused by warm air, from Chinook winds for instance, interacting with cold winter air. This bends waves of light near the ground, creating a mirror image of an object or making it look kind of wonky. It can happen on land or water. And finally, the Aurora Borealis. No, it doesn't just happen during winter, but it is a good time to see it. The nights are really long, so there's a lot of darkness and the Aurora, you know, is obviously visible when it's dark. We tend to have clear skies in the winter. We have, you know, really cold temperatures, which make this, which means the skies are really clear. And with the sun reaching the peak of an 11-year cycle, 
That means more solar storms and likely more aurora over the next couple of winters. So the next time you get the winter blues, remember some of the sights on these snowy, cold days and nights are pure gold. Ethan Williams, CBC News, Regina. This weather update is brought to you by Capital Ford Lincoln. The trade and upgrade event is on now. And Ethan joins me now. I wish we had some movie magic to make you come back upside down like that phenomena you told us about. Right. Yes, yes, exactly. Glowing like the aurora, maybe, uh, perhaps. But uh, yeah, we're experiencing a, a little bit of a phenomenon today, Sam and, Sam, and that is that we are quite warm in some parts of the province, very cold in others. In fact, 7 degrees at Maple Creek, that is 30 degrees nearly warmer than it is in the cold spot in the province, which is up in Stony Rapids at minus 22, an incredible temperature divide. And it's because of this, a stationary front, which has developed from a low pressure system, of course, warmest air closer to that low. And that stationary front kind of acts like a warm front, and it's called a stationary front, of course, because it really doesn't go anywhere, but warm air on the back side of it, cold air still on the other side. And then we have what's happening at the upper levels of the atmosphere. That jet stream, which has been sitting in the United States for the last few days, has finally moved its way northward. And parts of southern Saskatchewan are now to the south of the jet stream, which is allowing that warm air to build in. Some southerly winds, too, helping that, too. Now, that low-pressure system and associated front going to cause a little bit of messy weather over uh, these next few days here, next couple of days at least. First real system of 2023. We're going to be seeing some snow move through northern portions of the province tonight. For south and central, we're looking at increasing cloudiness and partly cloudy skies in the south. But getting into tomorrow, we're looking at that uh, system kind of really developing. Snow beginning to taper a little bit in the north. We're going to be seeing some mixed precipitation, maybe even some freezing rain in west central Saskatchewan, the Battlefords, Lloyd Minster. And in southern Saskatchewan, we're looking mostly at rain. Now, the question is if that's just going to uh, fall as rain or maybe a little bit of freezing rain and mixed precipitation as well. Tomorrow we'll have a better idea of that. But roads likely going to be messy with temperatures getting above the freezing mark and then getting back down to freezing as we head through the overnight hours. And then that system sliding eastward through the night. Southeastern Saskatchewan, you're still kind of in the warm sector of this low as we get through the night on Sunday. So still mixed precipitation possible. Those of you on the backside of the cold front, we're just looking at snowfall. And that should taper as we go through the day Sunday and then we're just left with cloud cover. Eastern sections of the Churchill region likely going to be seeing the most snow from this. 5 to 10 centimeters in places like LaRange and Cumberland House. And really all of the north get a good, uh, get a good blanket of snow, probably 5 centimeters. Now this model tends to overshoot things a little bit. I don't think rainfall amounts are going to be this heavy in southern Saskatchewan. But a corridor from Assiniboia Gravelberg to Regina Moose Jaw up toward the parklands of Yorkton Melville not ruling out kind of a corridor of some rain in that area. And of course, the question will be how much of it freezes and becomes freezing rain. So highway hotline going to be a, a good place to check over the weekend. Now, the pressure on that low pressure system not going to get too low. So there's not much of a divide between uh, the pressure. So the winds, as I mentioned yesterday, not going to get too bad. So we shouldn't be seeing any blowing snow. And if, in fact, I think through the weekend and into next week, we should see winds remaining fairly light. Now, here's how things play out. Regina, late on Saturday into Sunday is when we're going to get our moisture again. I think mostly falling in the form of rain. Clearing out on Sunday, left with cloud cover. A little bit of sunny breaks on Monday. A little bit colder in the wake of that system. But then we stay quite nice heading through the rest of the week. Saskatoon. I think if anything falls for you, it's going to be snow, maybe with a little bit of rain, one to three centimeters at the most. And then you're out of there, uh, out of that system by Sunday as well. And things remaining quite nice through the rest of the week. Not bad, Sam. Not bad at all. Five stars for that forecast. Oh, well, thank you. I'll <laughs> thank take you. it. Thank you bet. Ethan. As you in England is celebrating the birth of the world's rarest chimpanzee. The young male is a western chimp, which is a critically endangered subspecies native to western Africa. This furry fella has not been named yet, but the zoo has named other baby chimps after famous musicians, so you may be looking at the next Harry Styles. We'll be back after the break. Rescuers are searching for survivors a day after a massive storm ripped through several southern U.S. states, spawning dozens of tornadoes. At least nine people have been killed in Alabama and neighboring Georgia. Officials expect that number to climb. A 
The twisters left widespread wreckage behind across parts of Alabama. Hundreds of homes destroyed or seriously damaged. Roofs ripped off, trees uprooted. Strong winds knocked out power for tens of thousands of people. At least 35 possible tornadoes touched down across several states. Substantial damage is being reported in Selma. These images capture the moment one of the twisters barreled into the historic city. Alabama, where the majority of deaths occurred, declared a state of emergency in hard-hit counties. There's a break in California's flooding crisis, and it's going to be short-lived. Waves of storms are poised to strike again this weekend, and the rain has already started to fall. Susanna De Silva reports. For many people here in California, they're saying, here we go again. We're here in Capitola, and you can see that the waves are once again crashing on the shore as another storm is battering the coastline. You can see this was a beach. It is now filled instead with debris from the last storm earlier in the week. There's a pier just over there that still has the damage from that last storm. It was broken completely as the water crashed in. Again, water pouring off the coastline. This little area here is a very popular tourist area. It's a popular area with the community, a lot of rest restaurants, shops, businesses that people come down to. Most of them are closed today. Many of them are boarded up and still cleaning up from that storm earlier this week. So there was a storm in 82 that was worse than this, believe it or not. But this is a bad storm and the wharf is heartbreaking. As I understand it, the water cascaded off these cliffs and caused a cross current. The wharf is not built for that cross current. But if they don't fix it by March, by spring break, it'll be a huge economic impact. Further down south, it's the same story as you drive along the beaches, you see the debris, some of them with large pieces missing, cliffs that have now been created with erosion from that previous storm, now dealing with more erosion, more water coming ashore. And further down south in the area around the Salinas River, they are experiencing flooding there from that rain earlier this week. There's worry that Monterey may be completely cut off as some of those roots are covered up by water. It's also a very important farming area. A lot of the lettuce in the United States is grown in that area. A lot of that farmland is now underwater. And everyone, of course, waiting to see just how bad this storm is and the storms coming this weekend. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Capitola, California. My goodness, Ethan is back with one last look at your weather. Nothing like that. No, uh, that system certainly not going to bring anything like that to Saskatchewan uh, this weekend. But in Regina, we will see a nice warm-up by the time we get to tomorrow morning. Last little bit of sunshine before it all clouds over when we hit the afternoon. But nice and warm around minus 3. Precipitation starting later in the evening, overnight into Sunday. Saskatoon tomorrow morning, minus 8. Cloudy conditions again for you. I think we're not expecting too much precipitation, but that should come late evening tomorrow around minus 5 for your temperature at the noon hour. Want to send a shout out to Brent who sent us this beautiful sunrise photo as he drove along Highway 5 between Munster and where he teaches in Kelvington and Rose Valley. So shout out to all the folks in the Horizon School District where he teaches Horizon, a very fitting name for this, uh, for this photo in that school division, Sam. Absolutely. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. And before we leave you tonight, may we all head into the weekend with the same energy as these king penguins in Calgary. At the Calgary Zoo, they're getting ready for the official launch of the zoo's annual Winter Penguin Walks. It is always a big hit for visitors, of course, and the penguins love it too. Zoo staff say they rarely pass up the chance for a good, brisk waddle. And just like us, a daily walk is great for their health. The season's first penguin walk starts today and go every day until mid-March. And that's how we'll be walking on the ice if it freezes over again next week. That is it for us this week. You can get news anytime on our website or our YouTube channel. Glenn Reed is back with more tonight at 11. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.